our hands together for Miranda Klugscher. It took Justin Walker waking up in prison covered in the blood of his track coach to realize that he needed help. Like many students entering college, Justin had immediately jumped on the party train. But three years later, in April 2012, at just 20 years old, he found himself severely dependent on alcohol, consuming no less than four drinks in any given day and with no memory of a single weekend since his freshman year. But after drunkenly attacking a coach and teammate one night at practice, Justin decided to take one final attempt to get his life together. So he bailed out of jail and walked to his campus health center, desperate for support, where he was then informed that no one on campus can help him, handed a pamphlet, and turned away. Ashamed and hopeless, he dropped out of school this past fall. Now, Justin Walker was one of my former classmates at Hastings College. Stories like his are shockingly common, as HC is only one of over 2,300 schools across this nation fails to offer on-campus professional substance abuse counseling services, otherwise known as chemical dependency counselors, or CBCs. John Lauderley, a licensed mental health professional and college counselor, explains in a personal interview on August 30th, 2013, the institution doesn't see itself as responsible for fixing the problem, just for identifying that there might be a risk. Yet the National Center for Alcohol and Substance Abuse 2014 posits that one in every four college students is just like Justin, in that they meet the medical criteria for substance abuse and dependence, two and a half times the national average for the rest of the population. Look around you. Now there, of course, is no denying the level of individual responsibility that accompanies alcoholism. But the ability of the higher education system to blatantly ignore their role in such a pressing issue is abhorrent. We need to discuss the problem so that rehabilitation can begin. So today, we'll discuss the causes of our limited counseling access, the detrimental effects, and finally create solutions to what Counselor Lauderley calls the most taboo part of the best time of your life. Mm -hmm. Renowned party school, Arizona State University, has held numerous top 10 party school rankings from Forbes, PR Newswire, and even Playboy. <laughs> but one call to the campus health center revealed that although ASU students have access to acupuncture, gynecological, and psychiatry services, alcohol counseling somehow didn't make the cut. We can explore why through causes of both institutional negligence and professional red tape. Initially. Schools are failing to take any role in student alcohol problems. The National Institute of Health in 2014 explicates that students who begin drinking in their college age years are 47% more likely to suffer from alcoholism later in life. <coughs> Despite this, the American College Counseling Association, or ACCA 2014, posits that only one in every 100 college campuses has a CBC. Lauderley concedes that the majority mindset among colleges and universities is, it's not our responsibility to fix the problem. And the justification for their rationale is no less shocking. Dr. Gilbert Hinga, Vice President for Student Affairs at Hastings College states that no organization, specifically one that is so dependent on the financial backing of alumni, wants the publicity of having to develop a program specific to an area as stigmatized as chemical dependency. Because then you're admitting, we have a problem. <laughs> and second, the professional side of things doesn't get any less complicated. Mental health practitioner, or MHP, Stephanie Pershing, explains in an interview on January 30th, 2014, that although the licensure for CDCs doesn't even require a bachelor's degree, it's completely separate from the 3,000 hour extensive training required for the MHP licensure. The separation does far more harm than good. She argues that oftentimes alcoholism is a chemical mental dual diagnosis and requires a patient to spend valuable time referring back and forth between CDCs and MHPs. And taking time to certify as a CDC just isn't feasible. As the ACCA 2014 posits, when the average ratio of students to counselors often exceeds 700 to 1. 
Now, when I presented this issue to a panel of peers and faculty in April 2013 on campus, the unanimous response was, we didn't even realize this was a problem. And admittedly, Justin's story has been stifled due to two effects, stigma perpetuation and the normalization of alcohol. Initially, although the DSM-5 labels alcoholism as a mental illness, it is rarely viewed or treated as such within the collegiate population. UPI of 2014 states that although 2.8 million college students actively sought mental health counseling services last year, a majority of the 700,000 diagnosed with some level of alcoholism declined treatment solely because of the stigma behind the label. And Waddle Lee has seen it many times before, calling the system a vicious cycle. Because as the stigma increases, student willingness to seek support declines significantly leading schools, in turn, to justify their negligence with the apparent lack of student need. And the cycle only ends with students like Justin, who are brave enough to come forward, only to be told by the institution to which they dedicate their time, money, and talent, you're beyond our help. And second, alcohol has become normalized within the college culture. Samantha Goody of the University of Iowa earned the title of world's drunkest college student in September 2013 after being arrested and proudly tweeting the following day, blew a .341 in jail, YOLO. <laughs> At least we know how high the bar is set. <laughs> the National Institute of Health in 2014 explicates that Samantha's nonchalant attitude towards such a vitally pressing health concern is amplified by the collegiate population stating that the average college student drinks three to four times a week, and 75% of us will insist that alcohol is a necessary social lubricant. But an anonymous former student and AA member puts it in perspective, stating, if I were drinking as much now, at 25, as I was when I was in college, I would be labeled an alcoholic. But because I was in school, it was the norm, and it wasn't seen as a problem. From freshman year on, Students are recklessly primed to believe that college equals alcohol. And alcoholism has become just a side effect. Now many of us may never have to seek out the CDC. But that places the burden even more heavily on our shoulders to open the door for our peers like Justin. Now, growing up, both of my parents suffered from alcoholism, a problem that began in their college age years, and I am convinced that I'm not the only one in this room that can say that today but through the help they received from a CDC. Today they celebrate three years of sobriety with my sisters and I, and we have never been happier. I have seen firsthand the good that these programs will do for the lives of others. They aren't cop-outs for college kids who wanna go get drunk on the weekends. This is an investment in our future. And we can solve the discrepancy on levels of governmental, institutional, and personal engagement. First, on the governmental level, the United States Department of Health and Human Services needs to add the chemical dependency certification into its traditional course load, thus ensuring that all graduating MHPs are dual licensed. And Lee agrees on behalf of his profession, stating, it would add another area we'd be able to cover ethically and under licensure, thus improving the quantity and quality of services we'd be able to offer to our students. I've drafted a letter to the state level DHHS urging them to revisit the licensing guidelines for which they are responsible for ensuring. All they need is the contact information for your state office, but Nebraska's is already included. Please, sign one after the round, all right? I have a form you can fill out if you'd like me to email it to you for you to personalize. Second, on the institutional level, colleges and universities lacking CDCs need to partner with local counseling agencies to provide on-campus services. And, because the Affordable Care Act now mandates that many insurance providers, including those through which many of our schools insure our students, cover alcohol misuse screening and counseling, there's no better time to act than now. And even if your school is like mine and doesn't offer insurance to their students, our schools have still allocated part of our tuition and fee money to cover other physical and mental health services. And alcohol counseling, when there's a present need, shouldn't be an exception. Tell your schools that you demand fair access to all forms of mental health counseling and that their failure to provide as such is only perpetuating the stigma for those who need help the most. 
And finally, on the personal level, we as students, teachers, and community leaders need to increase awareness of this disparity. Therefore, you can start by advocating for the students on your local campus by starting an alcohol awareness group or simply joining one that's already active. Now, I partnered with the HC group Bacchus for a campaign to remember Justin, but our message that alcoholism will happen on any campus is universal. With me today, I have digital copies of our public affairs campaign available for implementation nationwide. It features a moderated discussion between Dr. Lauderly and myself and includes much of the same information that you heard today. Play it at your desk, on your campus radio station, or for peer, peer education groups. And second, I have pamphlets with general preventative guidelines that help to identify risky behavior. If you feel your community, campus, or even you yourself could benefit from hearing this message, please see me after the round. Stigma feeds on apathy, and it is high time we recognize that only by promoting alcohol education and rehabilitation can we be the first step towards a society that applauds those that admit that they need help, rather than casting shame. Today, we discuss the causes, effects, and solutions of our limited counseling access. The most sickening part of this whole debacle was how easy it was for my own school to turn Justin away in his darkest hour. But if we can start talking here about holding our schools accountable to the health needs of their students, they might start talking about it too. <laughs>